Scripture reading for today is found in Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Good morning, church. We are blessed, aren't we? We have a wonderful God who loved us so much that he gave his own son for us. We are here in the sanctuary worshiping him. And remember, we are here to worship him. And God has plans for us. God called us not just to help us once in a while when we go through a need, but actually to use us save precious souls for heaven, and then to spend eternity with him. That's more than we can comprehend. But we can start praising him even now, because God is worthy of our praises. I want to remind you again, there will be Bible study requests coming up. Be part of it. You will be blessed. The church will become more and more alive. The church will grow spiritually and numerically. Be part of the Bible studies, pick up a DVD with the training, ask questions if you have questions. I want to remind you about tonight, Vespers. Be there, don't miss it. If you miss it, you'll be in trouble. Before we start our uh, message today, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, what can we, what can I say? that would make any difference. Please come with your spirit and open the world for us and pour heavenly blessings on every single soul here and many others watching on the internet. May you be the center and may it all be for your honor. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We started some time ago to talk about the 10 promises and we said, and you already learned by now because I have repeated so many times, that the Ten Commandments are ten promises. And they are God's covenant. There is no difference between the old and the new covenant. In Exodus 32, 33, 34, it doesn't say, I give you a new covenant because the old one is not good. It says the old covenant renewed. The same one. In fact, Moses didn't come with new commandments. He brought the same ten. God didn't change uh, iota. God didn't change anything. God doesn't change. Except that people didn't understand that the covenant is not based on us. It's based on God. Because God said, I will go before you. I'll give you a country that doesn't belong to you. I'll give you victories over armies that are greater than you. I'll give you gardens that you never worked. That would be fun for me. But it doesn't happen now. I'll give you homes that you didn't build. I'll give you a new heart. I will put this word in your hearts. And this is not because you deserve it. This is not because you did something. You are a stubborn nation. This is because I love you. You are my children. On one condition, let me be your God. Would you? Would you let me be the single one in your heart? Number one, number two, number ten, number twenty, everything. Would you let me be your God? If you do that, I will do all these things for you, cost free. That was the covenant. Israel didn't get it. They said, we will do all that God said. And they failed in a short time. So God came back to them and said, you are a stubborn nation. You cannot do it. How can you do it? With your human sinful nature. So this is the covenant. Let me repeat it again. I will do it for you. Just let me be your God. Well, we learned that the Ten Promises represent what God is trying to do for us 
if we let him be our God. Therefore, the order is not by chance. He could have said, let the fourth be the first. No. The first commandment or promise is the first because it's foundational. is the basis for all the others. I am your God who delivered you. Don't have other gods. If this one is followed, we should not have problems with the others. Because if he is our God, he will do the other things for us. If not, we could struggle forever. It will never happen. We'll just paint the exterior. Inside, stinky dead. So, therefore, the first promise should be the first because the others built on and it's conditional for the others to follow the first. And we said that the Ten Commandments start from verse 2. And that's a chorus, a refrain to the others that comes before and after every commandment. I am your God who delivered you. Don't have other gods. But it's a conditional in Hebrew. If I am your God who delivers you. And he doesn't say, don't have other gods. It's not negative, it's positive. If I am your God, if you allow me, if you want, if you allow me to be your God, I promise I'm going to work on you. You will not have other gods. And then it repeats again. If you allow me to be your God, you know what? You will not have all that, those idols. And if you allow me to be your God, you will not take God's name in vain. And if you allow me to be your God, you'll keep the Sabbath and so on. So the second verse comes before and after every commandment. And we said that the Ten Commandments actually were written by God's finger. It came from his palm on precious stone back and forth, both sides, so they could be seen from every direction. Now, as we said that, we went through the all nine promises. We said they are, they are all positive, they are all promises, well, we got to the 10th one, and we have two more to go. Well, I know there are not 12, but we will make it 12. So, we got to the 10th one. Let me, before we go, give you an IQ test. You know what is an IQ test? It shows if you are intelligent or not. Sorry. <laughs> it would measure our intelligence, okay? So, listen carefully. Are you ready? Huh? Okay, listen carefully. What animal, pick the animal that doesn't match the others. Ready? Dog, cat, lamb, horse. Oh, come on, you have a C minus. Lamb, you know why? Should have been dog, cat, sheep, horse. All adults. If you want puppies, babies, then you say, Puppy, kitten, lamb, colt. You follow me? Okay, you failed this one. I'm going to give you another one easier. Okay, listen carefully. Pick the number that doesn't match the other numbers. Listen carefully. 3, 6, 15, 20. 20! You know why? Because all the others are divisible by 3. 3, 6, 15. But 20 is not, should have been 21. Because 21 you can divide by 3. Okay, now you got the game. I'm going to make an IQ test based on the Ten Commandments. Pick the one commandment that doesn't match the others. Ooh, listen carefully. Do not kill. Do not lie. Do not steal. Do not covet. Which one? Do not cover it. Sure. Why? And you may say, because we didn't cover this commandment. That's the right answer for the wrong reason. <laughs> because all the other nine have to do with external behavior. The tenth deals with the heart and mind. So if the first one is the foundation for the other nine, the last one, in fact shows where the change starts. 
shows what should be changed. In fact, during announcements and during the prayer, it was emphasized, create in me a new heart. Well, this commandment, this commandment, the tenth one, deals with the heart. You follow me? Because we can improve behavior. We can control ourselves to a certain extent. Nevertheless, if the heart is not changed, nothing has changed. You follow me? So, <clears throat> let's move a little forward and try to explore the tenth promise. The Hebrew word, do not covet. In fact, it says, if you allow me to be your God, you, will not you shall not covet, I promise you. So, the Hebrew word is shamad. Shamad in translation in English means to desire or to delight in something. Tell me, is it wrong to desire or to delight? No. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that he had no beauty, so we didn't desire him. But in Hebrew is we didn't covet him. Same word, shamad, talking about Jesus. Then Paul in Corinthians says that we should desire the good gifts using the same word. There is nothing wrong to desire something good. The word is neither negative nor positive. The word is not good, it's not bad, it's just neutral. The context makes it good or bad. It depends what you desire. You see, you can go to your neighbor and say, man, I love your house. You have a nice, nice house. So far, so good. And then you say, would you teach me how you did it? Would you show me the blueprints? I want to build myself one the same. That's okay. But you can go to your neighbor, see the house, and say in your mind, I'm going to get it. No matter what. I'll find a way. I'm going to get his house. That's wrong. You look to your neighbor and you say, man, you have a nice family. You and your spouse, you get along so nice. You can say, when I get married, I would love to have this type of relationship with my spouse. That's okay. Or you can say, you know what? I want your spouse. If I had yours instead of mine, it would be I would be better off. That's wrong. So, what is wrong about desire? Shamad. It's not that you desire. But in translation is when you desire something, listen carefully, that doesn't belong to you. You follow me? When you desire something that doesn't belong to you. And you can desire things that don't belong to you in two directions. What belongs to God and what belongs to your neighbor. Well, what can you desire from God that belongs to God? I could give you stories. For instance, what belongs to your neighbor. You remember in 1 Kings chapter, I believe, uh, 20, 21, somewhere there, I believe, 21, Ahab noticed a nice field with a vineyard that was not his, belonged to? Yes, thank you, you know the Bible. And he looks there and he says, let me buy it from you. And the other guy, neighbor, says, but, but this is inheritance from generation to generation in my family. I'm sorry, I cannot. The country is large. You can plant anything you want. You are the king. He says, no, 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 no. I want yours. If you don't give it to me, I'll get it. And he devised a plan, killed the guy, though he was, he was innocent, and got the field. That's what I'm talking about. Desire what doesn't belong to you and get it by any means. Now listen carefully. So, the, what can you desire that belongs of God, that is God's? There is a story in uh, Joshua chapter 6. They got to Jericho and Joshua gave them clear instruction. When you get to Jericho, do not touch anything because it belongs to God. Why in Jericho things would belong to God and then the next cities they could touch things, they could take things. They didn't belong to God. What was the difference? Just God wanted something, you know, I'm going to pick that. Is that? There was a rule in the Bible that we forgot long ago. That God should come first. 
that whatever was first, first fruit, first born, you remember? Belonged to God. Whatever is first in your life, that should belong to God. If your son is first, should belong to God, should be dedicated, should be God's. And they all knew that. Jericho was the first city from the promised land to be taken. Therefore, Jericho belonged to God. And they were not supposed to touch what was God's. And Achan knew it. He knew it. And then he says he saw some things and he liked them. You, you remember the story? It says there in uh, Joshua chapter 6, verse 7 to 21. It says, uh, I saw a plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and an uh, edge of gold weighing, uh, weighing 50 shekels. And then what does he say in your Bible? I coveted them, the word shamad. Now listen carefully, I'm going to make a parenthesis. An inappropriate desire leads to an inappropriate action. You want me to repeat it? An inappropriate desire that is dwelled in, cherished, nurtured, allowed, permitted, would always lead to an inappropriate action. So he says, I saw it there, I coveted them, and then it says, I took them. Now let me ask you, do you think it's wrong to see? Hey, I saw that BMW in the parking. It's a nice car. There is nothing wrong to like it. I love it. But I'm not going to take it. It's not mine. The problem is when you cherish the desire. Let me explain. He knew details. The guy did research. That was from Babylonia. He knew the, he, the weight. He knew the brand. He knew what it was made from Babylonia. So heavy, so many shekels. The guy dwelled on it. He contemplated. He cherished. He nurtured. He planned. When you start dwelling, you see it? My father had a word. I would say, what should I do if I see it? And my father said, well, there are many birds flying over your head. The problem is not that they fly. The problem is if you allow them to make a nest on your head. You follow me? You see it. Good for them. They are there. Move on. That's what Jesus said. You see it? Don't even look after. Turn your head. Turn your mind. You remember? It's not yours. Don't let it make a nest on your head. So he saw it, and he then started to contemplate. And he started to cherish it. And he started to nurture it, and to feed it, and to plan it, and to do research. And it led to sin. And 36 innocent people died. Think about their families, their children, their wives. And Achan and his family died. That's where inappropriate desire would lead. And you know why? Very simple. Because God should be first. And when we covet, guess who is first? I want it. I like it. I take it. Who is first? I. I am the God of myself. That's what Satan did, didn't he? So, <clears throat> there is nothing wrong to desire something. Don't get me wrong. You see a field, you see a house, you go home and start saving. There is a for sale sign. You save money, you borrow some from the bank. Right now it has a small interest. You go there and you buy it. Good for you. But when you say, I'm going to get it, no matter what, that's wrong. Same word. Same word is used, shamad, in many places in the Bible. For instance, Proverbs 6.25. Do not lost in your heart after her beauty. But the word is not lost. It's shamad, it's covered. Why? Because she's not yours. The context makes it bad, not the word. Micah 2.2, 2. listen. They covet fields and size them. They covet houses and take them. They rob a man of his house. How do they take them? Do they buy them? 
They rob a man of his house and defraud a man of his inheritance. They don't just buy them, they defraud. It's not a for sale sign. The context. So listen again, church. An inappropriate desire cherished leads to an inappropriate action. That's the reason the Ten Commandments, the Ten Promises is so important. Because if you cherish a wrong desire long enough, it will surely lead to sin. The other nine commandments have to deal with external behavior. The Ten Commandments deals with the heart, the mind, the passions, the reasons, the thoughts. People judge us for our actions. Nine commandments. God looks to the heart. Reasons, motives, passion, thoughts. Nobody would know what I think right now about you or about you. God knows. You cannot judge me for what I think. God does. Because that's where the spring is. That's where sin starts. It starts growing, and then when you do it, it's already too late. That's what should be changed. We work on external behavior. God wants us to have a new heart. The tenth is what leads to the breaking of the other nine. Let me explain a little. If sin is at the center, if self is at the center, then we break the commandments. Then we break the relationship with God and the relationship with the neighbor. And let me explain. The relationships we have with the people and with God show who we are. Oh, we can say we are good Christians. We can pretend forever that we love God. Doesn't make any difference. Relationships show our true spiritual state. That's who we are. Now, if God is at the center, that's righteousness. Then it comes love that springs spontaneously in good deeds without any effort. That's when we shine his character. In fact, Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. When he is at the center of our heart. Therefore, we should not even try to change our behavior. And you say, Pastor, you lost your mind. We should try. No. We should plead. Didn't Jacob try all his life to change his behavior? Did he really manage? Therefore, we should plead with God, like David, creating me. And it's not about fixing our broken heart. We don't talk about a fixing heart surgery. We talk about transplant heart surgery. It takes a miracle of creation where God has to create us like in the beginning again. It says creating me, not fixing me, a new heart because God, not even God, can fix our broken hearts. God has to kill our old nature. You cannot build a new life on the foundation of the old life. You cannot build a new life on the old nature. The old nature has to die. That's what Paul says in Corinthians. I die daily. You remember? I have been crucified with Christ in Galatians chapter 2. 5, I'm sorry, 520. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Therefore, church, we should die daily. You may try forever to change. You will fail miserably. Before we die and before Christ is born in us and before he would do the miracle of a new creation and he would create in us a new heart and give us a new spirit, we will never be victorious. But the good news is that he promised to do that. The bad news is that we never get it. We try to do it ourselves instead of surrendering, instead of allowing him to do it. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. I promise, says in Hebrew, I will give you a new heart. I will take your heart that is hard out and I'll give you a new heart that is soft and loving. I will pour my love in your hearts. That's a promise. Isn't that nice? There is a quotation in the spirit of prophecy that says, the actual life of Christ would be in us. Listen, do you, do you, do you hear what, what she says? The actual life of Christ 
would be in us. We would actually live his life the way he lived it. When we allow him to give us a new heart. When we die to self, Paul got it. When we die to self, until then there is no hope. When we die to self, Christ comes, moves, lives in us, and we no longer live. That's what the Ten Commandments is talking about. It's not just the sacrifice of the bad habits and desires. It's the sacrifice of total self with all the, the desires, good and bad. It's the sacrifice of self, good and bad. It's not just the sinful self that must go. The righteous self needs to go too. Listen, self is the enemy we need to fear most. No form of vice has more malignant effect upon the character of the Christians than the self-righteous that is not crucified and not under the control of the Holy Spirit. When self is submerged in Christ and Christ is in control, true love would spring spontaneously. Surrendering self to God is what he requires and nothing else. Ministry of Healing, page 485. Self needs to die. That's the Ten Commandment. That's the Ten Promise. So let's move on here a little. Paul got it. He says, listen, I think I'm doing pretty well. I keep Sabbath. I don't kill. I don't steal. I, I, I am doing pretty well. But then in Romans chapter 7, he gets to verse 7 and 8. And he gets to the Ten Commandments and says, I'm in trouble. Why? Because I have to deal with the desires, not the acts, not what I do, but the mind. I am in trouble because I don't do what I want to do. I, I do what I don't want to do. And what should I do? I hate it because my mind is sick. My heart is sick. I can control myself to a certain extent, but I cannot change my mind. And Paul says, what a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me? You remember? Well, if Paul says that, we need that. We should say the same. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me? Well, church. You know what word he uses there where he says desires? He doesn't use the Hebrew shamad. He uses the Greek epithumia. That we have the English word epidemia, epidemic. That's epidemic. That's a disease. It's contagious and it multiplies. That's the reason Psalm 139 says, Oh Lord, you know my desires. You know my thoughts. You know when I sit down, when I rise. You know my heart. You know my ways. We may be able to fool people. You know, at times we can even fool ourselves. But we cannot fool God. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows our thoughts. He knows our reasons. He knows and nobody knows what we think. And he is judging that. So church, if I stopped here, you would be depressed for the rest of the week. But praise the Lord, Paul didn't stop here, so I don't stop here either. So Paul moves from this dilemma and he says, you know, I thought I was doing pretty well with the external, but I got to the Ten Commandments that deals with the heart and the mind, and I, I am a wretched man. I know that the law is spiritual and good, there is nothing wrong with the law, but I am slave to sin, he says. And he gets to verse 15. Verse 15. He says, I hate what I do. And then listen carefully. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Verse 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. Why? There is hope, church. There is hope. There is hope. Listen carefully. This is where the hope comes in. How is hope coming to you? When the culture says Madison Avenue and the mall and the Hollywood... And you know, all of them, the internet, bombarding us to lost after things, to lost after people. How is hope coming to you? Who is going to deliver you and me? This is God's promise for you today. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is what? 
a fixed old creation or a new creation altogether? Well, the word, this is chiastic structure in, in Greek. The most important word is put right in the middle of the sentence. You know what word is in the middle of the sentence? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In Greek, the word in the middle is, it's a very simple two-letter word, in. I was shocked. I saw chiastic structure. I said, Christ should be in the middle now. And it was not. The word that was the center of the sentence, the most important, the key, was in. If anyone is in, not besides, not about, in Christ, then he is, promise, a new creation. Therefore, in John 15, Jesus says, without me, lost. In me, no problem. Because there is no other name. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you follow me, church? This is, this should be our prayer. Would you please kill my heart? Would you please kill self in me? Take it out. Would you please give me a new heart? And would you please move in me? And just live in me? And just control me? And let me die daily? Because this is the key that should be our daily prayer. And this is our single hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Therefore, we need, church, to remind ourselves daily. Number one, that we should die daily. Number two, that Christ should live in us, should dwell, should move there and live there permanently. Second, not just day by day, second by second. That's the key. And now listen carefully. Every time we forget, we need to remind ourselves that happens not because we deserve. We may be wretched, but because he loves us. Therefore, don't look for merits. Look for Christ. You follow me? As long as you look for merits, you will still struggle. Look for Christ because when you find him as you are, you get a gift, a new heart. Isn't that nice? Say it with me. In Christ, I am a new creation. Would you say it? In Christ, I am a new creation. I am a, I am a child of the king. Isn't that nice? Well, without Christ, I am nothing. But in Christ, I am a new. He gives me a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, a new life, a new nature. In fact, he lives in me. And because he lives, I will live. You see, if you remind yourself daily, today, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, next week, every day, following days, that in Christ you are, this is a promise a new creation, then all you have to do is to die daily and to invite him to, lead in, to, to live in you daily. That may not be so simple, but you have that choice. And he promised he will honor it and do more than you imagine. He will do the miracle of a new creation. And this is what Paul says, Philippians chapter 4, it brings him a godly contentment. When you know that who you are, but you know who he is, and you know that you are in him, then you know what? You are content. Let me explain. He says in verse 12, I know what is to be in need, and I know what means to have plenty. I don't need to covet, because I learned the secret of being content in any situation. Don't tell me, pastor, I'm, I'm, I'll cover it because I have that need. Paul says, I've been free, I've been in prison, I've been rich, I've been poor. I've been in all situations, I've been everything. But I learned to be content. Even in prison, he would praise the Lord and sing, you remember? Why? I learned the secret of being content. What is the secret? Tell me. What is the secret of being content? It's very simple. It's the next verse. I learned the secret. It says, 
Because I can do all, how many? Things through Christ who strengthens me. This is the secret. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is in you. You can do all things. There is nothing impossible. Because he can do it. He is God. He does whatever he wants. He wants to do it. So church, you remember the old song, this world is not my home. I am just passing through. Open your bulletins, first page, back of the first page. And you'll see it there. My treasures are laid up where? Somewhere beyond. Did, did you open your bulletins? You found the song? The back of the first page? Sing it with me. Would you? This world is not my home, I am just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Thank you. When you know that Christ is in you, you are satisfied. You don't covet. It's sufficient. You don't need anything because in Christ you have all you need. You don't even focus on what you need because your identity is not given by your house or your car or your education or your titles. You are not who you are because of those. You are who you are because of Christ in you. Your identity is based on Christ, not based on what you accomplish. Therefore, you are satisfied. That's what Paul says. I am content. I don't care, Paul says, if I have or I don't have, if I am free, if I live, I die. I don't care. I am content. I have a godly contentment. I have joy. I have peace. Why? I can do all things in Christ because he lives right here. And I am not even focusing on those things. I don't care. I am focusing on those things. I am not living here anymore. I may be here, but I live there. That's who we are, church. Never forget that we are in transit here. If we live for this and here, we are miserable. I am content. Whenever you realize that in Christ you have all you need, then there is freedom and peace and joy coming to you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment, it's a great gain. Church, I pray this for you and for me and for all those that are watching today with us, worshiping with us. Because remember, we brought nothing in this world and we take nothing when we go. If we don't have Christ, we have nothing. I'm not saying that it's holy to be poor. Abraham was rich. I would love to be rich. <laughs> there are rich people that are spiritual people. There are poor people that are spiritual people. And there are rich people that are mean and evil. And there are poor people that are mean and evil. Would you agree with me? It's not about how much you have. It's about who you have. That makes the difference. So if I live in a tent, that would be nice for just a weekend. Or if I live in a mansion by the lake with a big boat, I'm happy either way, or I hope. <laughs> if you get a job, you say, praise the Lord. I got a new job. I'm going to praise the Lord, and I'm going to use it for his glory. And if you lose a job, you say, it's hard, but I'm going to praise the Lord. He lives in me. With him, I'm going to get through. I get a child. Praise the Lord, a newborn in the family. I'm going to use him to serve the Lord, dedicate him to the Lord. If I lose a child, that's tough. But you'll say, I know I'll see him when my Lord comes. Whatever you go through, you'll have peace when the king lives in you. 
Church, some of you may be struggling. Today, I want to tell you that Jesus can set you free from all the bad desires and thoughts if you allow him to be your king. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we have been through these ten promises. And we understand that the key is not what we do or who we are, but the key is in you. Would you please take our hearts today and give us new hearts, give us new minds, and move and live in us. We pray in humbleness, in Jesus' name, and we thank you. Amen.